This week, we are reading The Red Guards by Zhi Li Zhang. In this excerpt from Zhi Li Zhang's memoir, Red Scarf Girl, the Cultural Revolution is underway. Zhang's family lives in fear of the Red Guards because her great-grandfather was a wealthy landlord. In this selection, the Red Guards pay a visit to the family's apartment, ostensibly to look for weapons. The guards leave the apartment in disarray, having destroyed some of Zhang's most precious possessions. Um, a key term in that, what I just read, was a excerpt. An excerpt is a part of a story. Uh, this comes from, this is actually a chapter or two from a larger book called The Red Scarf Girl. So, um, and I would recommend it. Uh, I read it a few years back, and it is a good story about the Cultural Revolution in China, which was a very, uh, a very difficult time for the Chinese people. Um, the government came in, and they were trying to get rid of a lot of the old ways, um, the old Chinese ways, and uh, in order to do that, they had to basically have people destroy them. Now, there are two literary terms we need to know this week. The first one is author's perspective. An author's personal feelings about a subject affect the way he or she writes about it. The combination of ideas, values, feelings, and beliefs that shape the way an author looks at a topic is called the author's perspective. In nonfiction, you can identify the author's perspective by paying attention to direct statements by the author that tell you what he or she thinks, feels, or cares about, and words he or she uses to describe people, events, and things. Now remember in this story that we're reading today, uh, the author, Zhi Li Zhang, actually was a supporter of the Cultural Revolution until about mm, a couple of chapters before this. And now she's seen kind of the negative parts of the Cultural Revolution. Now, I do have a short PowerPoint here that I want to go over for um, symbolism, which is another term we have to worry about. Uh, symbolism, what you see is not always what you get. <clears throat> Sometimes you get more. As you can see here, you've got the leaves, and inside there you've got the, uh, looks like a green and yellow snake. A symbol is an object that represents a greater idea, an icon or a picture that stands for a bigger meaning. When people around the world see the American flag, that is a symbol of freedom. Um, it's a symbol of our great country. Even toddlers recognize common symbols. McDonald's was the very first sign my kids could read. Um, most of you, if you see the target sign, you know it, what it's talking about also. Groups use them too. Um, here we have a few. One's a baseball team. Uh, we've got two different religions. Um, the one in the middle, is that's called the Star of David. That's for the Jewish religion. And then we have the cross, which symbolizes the Christian faith. We use symbols when texting to represent larger thoughts. Um, the text messaging, LOL, no, I'm not busy, I'm only driving. This is kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. The symbolism is the car is destroyed, and this person is uh, looks like they're really hurt or possibly dying. Um, and it's a message saying, don't text and drive. Colors often symbolize moods also. Um, if you see something blue or cold, they usually call that. That usually means you're kind of sad. Um, if you, the brighter the color, the red, the more excited you are, or maybe the more angry you are. So, uh, and these were mood rings, or, which are popular. Uh, weather can also symbolize it. Here we have a gentleman sitting on a rock. Uh, everything's sunny around him except for the rain cloud. So you can tell that he's kind of, um, in a uh, foul mood, and we have a sunny, looks like a sun coming out from behind rain clouds, and that usually symbolizes um, new beginnings or a brighter day ahead. Here we have red swirls. Once again, we have those red, red colors, which usually mean anger or conflict. And this is a ribbon we've seen a lot in October. Um, we all know that this is for breast cancer awareness, but 
without even saying that, that, that just the color and the ribbon itself linked it to a larger idea. Remember that symbols are items that re or are items that represent a larger idea or meaning. Uh, we see the skull and crossbones. We know that that is one of two things: either a pirate ship coming, or it means that something is poisonous, and that is a symbol for poison. Here we have a whole heart and a broken heart. We all know what that means. Which one of these would you rather have? Which one means love and which one means death? Seasons can also be used as symbols too. A lot of times the green uh, spring type season is seen as being the time of rebirth. So if we're talking about in your lifetime, the green spring would be your childhood. And the winter down there is usually referred to as being near the end of life when you're an old man or an old lady. Wedding rings, okay? When I got married, the minister went through a big speech about how the wedding rings are a circle and they go on and on forever, just like love should go on and on forever. And wedding rings themselves are a symbol of love. Remember, symbols are objects that have a greater meaning. And that's all the farther I'm going to go on that. As you are uh, reading the story today, make sure you're paying attention for symbolism that comes up. So without further ado, we're going to get going on Zhili Zhang's story. In the following excerpt, Zhili Zhang is 12 years old and the Cultural Revolution is underway. At first a loyal supporter of Chairman Mao, Zhili's perspective changes after her late grandfather's status as a wealthy landlord becomes known. Mao's government considers landlords and their families possible enemies of the people. Now classified by the Red Guards as having suspicious status, the Zhang family lives in fear. Mom got home from work that evening looking nervous. She whispered to Dad and Grandma, and as soon as we finished dinner, she told us to go outside and play. We have something to take care of, she said. I knew this had something to do with the Cultural Revolution. I wish she would just say so. We were too old to be fooled like little children. But I didn't say anything and went outside with the others. And here's A for the, cultural pers or the author's perspective. The author is an adult, but she writes the event as a young girl. Why might a child narrator help the ch reader understand the author's perspective than an adult would now? As I look at this, I'm looking at it from a child's point of view, um, I see things kind of at face value. But if it was written as a, an adult, I would see what's going on around, and I would be able to uh, justify more of what's happening. So I think having a child perspective helps the author uh, stay a little bit more in character. When it was nearly dark, Ji Yun and I went back home, leaving Ji Yong with his friends. As we entered the apartment, I smelled smoke, acrid and choking. I looked around in alarm, but Grandma was sitting alone in the main room, showing no signs of worry. Grandma, is there a fire? We shouted anxiously, don't you smell the smoke? Hush, hush. Grandma pulled us to her quickly. It's nothing. They're just burning some pictures. We looked puzzled. Your mother heard today that photos of people in old-fashioned long gowns and mandarin jackets are considered four-olds. So your parents are burning them in the bathroom. Now, I see this little two here. That two is called a footnote, and if I look down at the bottom of the page here, it's going to explain what mandarin jackets and four-olds are. It says, mandarin jackets are fancy jackets with narrow stand-up collars. They were one of the four-olds, old ideas, old culture, old customs, and old habits that were forbidden during the Cultural Revolution. So anything that reminded these people of the old times was forbidden and called four-olds. There were four of them. And Mandarin jackets just happened to fall in that. Can we watch? 
I loved looking at pictures, especially pictures of all those uncles and aunts I had never met. Grandma shook her head. I winked at Ji Yoon, and we both threw ourselves into her arms, begging and pleading. As always, she gave in and went to the bathroom door to ask Mom and Dad. Mom opened the door a crack and let us in. The bathroom was filled with thick smoke that burned our eyes and made us cough. Dad passed us a glass of water. We can't open the window any wider, he said. The neighbors might notice the smoke and report us. Mom and Dad were sitting on small wooden stools. On the floor was a tin wash bowl full of ashes and a few pictures disappearing into flames. At Dad's side was a stack of old photo albums, their black covers stained and faded with age. Dad was looking through the albums, page by page, tearing out any pictures that might be four olds. He put them in a pile next to Mom, who put them into the fire. I picked up one of the pictures. It was of Dad sitting on a camel when he was about six or seven years old. He was wearing a wool hat and pants with suspenders, and he was laughing. Grandma, looking very young and beautiful and wearing a fur coat, was standing beside him. Now, consider what the photographs symbolize to the Red Guards. What might the photographs symbolize to the Zhang family? Record this information in your chart. Now, as I'm looking here, all of these things, maybe the wool hats and the um, nice clothes and sitting on a camel, those might symbolize uh, a rich, wealthy family, which is kind of looked down upon in this culture. But to the family, they're not looking at all the items in there. They're looking at their dad when they're young and their grandma when she was young and beautiful. So uh, even though the pictures symbolize one thing to the Red Guards, they symbolize something totally different to the Zhang. It's more their history than anything. Mom, this one doesn't have any long gowns or anything, Ji Yun said. Can't we keep it? The Red Guards might say that only a rich child could ride a camel, and beside, Grandma's wearing a fur coat. She threw it into the fire. Mom was right, I thought. A picture like that was four olds. The flames licked around the edges of the picture. The corners curled up, then turned brown. The brown spread quickly toward the center, swallowing Grandma, then the camel, and finally Dad's woolen hat. Picture after picture was thrown into the fire. Each in turn curled, melted, and disappeared. The ashes in the wash bowl grew deeper. Finally, there was no more pictures left. Mom poured the ashes into the toilet and flushed them away. Now, why do you think they were being as secretive as what they were? Um, if you notice up here, they said that they had to be careful so that the, the neighbors didn't turn them in. Sounds like they lived in a uh, area and a civilization that if you were even doing anything suspicious at all, like burning things inside your house, um, you would have, you'd be looked into by the police or the authorities. That night I dreamed that the house was on fire. Early in the morning, Song Popo rushed upstairs to tell us the news. All the neighbors were saying that a knife had been found in the communal garbage bin. The neighborhood dictatorship group had declared this to be an illegal weapon. So the entire bin had been searched and some incompletely burned pictures found. In one of them, they recognized my fourth aunt. Because my fourth uncle had fled to Hong Kong right before liberation, her family was on the Neighborhood Party Committee's list of black families. The weapon was automatically associated with the pictures, and that was enough for Six Fingers to report to the powerful Neighborhood Party Committee. Now, Six Fingers we're going to hear about. Um, his name is Mr. Nee. He's the chairman of the neighbor, Neighborhood Dictatorship Group. He had six fingers on one hand, so the people obviously didn't call it to him to his face, but that's what they called him. Um, and they mentioned a couple of things, a fourth aunt. Uh, it basically means the fourth child born to the parents. So it would be an aunt, but it would be the fourth brother or sister. And 
talking about black families are not talking about color or race or anything like that. What they're talking about is because they are seen as a troublemaking family, they're considered a black family. So black would be bad at this time. Okay. Um, all day we were terrified. Grandma and the three of us went to the park immediately after breakfast. This time, none of us wanted to play. We just sat together on Grandma's bench. Will the Red Guards come? Ji, Ji Yung asked. Maybe they will, sweetie, Grandma answered. We just don't know. She took out her knitting. I tried to do the same, but I kept finding myself staring into space with no idea of where I was in the pattern. Ji Yoon and Ji Yang ran off to play, but always came back to the bench after a few minutes. At four o'clock, Grandma sent me to see if anything was happening at home. I cautiously walked into the alley, alert for anything unusual, but there was no sounds of drums or gongs or noise at all. The mop was still on the balcony, and we'll find out that the mop on the balcony was actually a signal used by the Zhangs to indicate family members when it was safe to return home. Okay, so kind of unique. I looked in our lane, there were no trucks, everything seemed calm, and I told Grandma it was safe to go home. Mom and Dad both came home earlier than usual. Dinner was short and nearly silent. Soon after dinner, we turned the lights off and got into bed, hoping that the day would end peacefully, after all. I lay for a long while without sleeping, but finally drift into a restless doze. When I heard pounding on the door downstairs, I was not sure whether it was real or a dream. It was real. I heard my cousin, you may, ask bravely, who's there? Six Fingers' voice replied, the Red Guards, they're here to search your house, open up. They rushed into Fourth Aunt's apartment downstairs. At first we could not hear much, then we heard more, doors slamming, a cry from Ha Ha. Crash after crash of dishes breaking overhead, and the indistinct voices of the red guards. By the time we were all awake, by this time we were all awake, but no one turned on a light or said anything. We all lay and held our breaths and listened, trying to determine what was going on downstairs. No one even dared to turn over. My whole body was tense. Every sound from my fourth aunt's room made me stiffen with dread. Thirty minutes passed, then an hour. In spite of the fear, I began to feel sleepy again. I was jolted awake by shouts and thunderous knocks. Someone was shouting Dad's name. Ji Zi Rang, get up! Zhang Zi Rang. Dad went to the door. Uh, what do you want? Open up! Six Fingers shouted. This is a search in passing. The Red Guards were going to search your home in passing. Now, a search and passing in America would be illegal. This would be like a police officer walking by your house and just knocking on the door and say, hey, I'm going to search it. In the United States, they have to have a uh, search warrant, but here in China during this time, they did not. We often ask somebody to buy something in passing or get information in passing, but I'd never heard of a searching a house in passing. Dad opened the door. The first one in was Six Fingers, wearing an undershirt and dirty blue shorts and flip-flops. Behind him were about a dozen teenage red guards. Though the weather was still quite warm, they all wore tightly belted army uniforms. Their leader was a zealous, loud-voiced girl with short hair and large eyes. With your relationship with the Zhangs living downstairs, the girls yelled, her hand aggressively on her hip. He is, or what is your relationship? He is her brother-in-law, Six Fingers answered before Dad could open his mouth. Oh, so you're a close relative, she said, as if she only now realized that. Leniency for confession, severity for resistance. Hand over, hand over your weapons now, or we will be forced to search the house. She stood up straight and stared at Dad. What weapons? Dad asked calmly. We have no... Search! She cut Dad off with a shouted order and shoved him aside. At the wave of her arm, the red guards behind her stormed in. Without speaking to each other, they split into three groups and charged toward our drawers, cabinets, and chests. 
The floor was instantly strewn with their contents. They demanded what uh, mom and dad opened anything that was locked, while we children sat on our beds staring in paralyzed fascination. To my surprise, it was not as frightening as I had imagined through the weeks of waiting. Only little White was panicked by the crowd or the crowd and the noise. She scurried among the open chests until she was kicked by a red guard. Then she ran up into the attic and did not come down. And I look here, little white is the family's cat. That's kind of what I assumed. Okay. Now, making an inference or a educated guess, Zhang stares in paralyzed fascination. Why isn't the experience as frightening as she thought it might be? Part of it may be the fact that the Red Guards are young children. They're teenagers. And uh, China at this time wanted teenagers because they were very easy to convince into following. Um, and they liked having the power of going after the older people, the parents. So during this time when children are normally kind of rebellious, they were given this power to be almost like police. And she probably didn't feel as threatened by them as what her parents did. I watched one boy going through the wardrobe. He took each piece of clothing off its hanger, hanger and threw it on the floor behind him. He went carefully through a drawer and unrolled the neatly paired socks, tossing them over his shoulder one by one. I turned my head and saw another boy opening my desk drawer. He swept his hand through it and jumbled everything together before removing the drawer and turning it upside down on the floor. Before he could examine the contents, another one called him away to help move a chest. All my treasures were scattered on the floor. The butterfly fell out of its glass box. One wing was crushed under a bottle of glass beads. My collection of candy wrappers had fallen out of their notebook and were crumpled under my stamp album. My stamp album? It had been a birthday gift from Grandma when I started school, and it was my dearest treasure. For six years, I had been getting canceled stamps from my friends, carefully soaking them to get every bit of envelope paper off. I had collected them one by one until I had a complete set. I had even bought some inexpensive sets with my own allowance. I loved my collection, even though I knew I should not. With the start of the Cultural Revolution, all the stamp shops were closed down because stamp collecting was considered bourgeois. And if it was bourgeois, that meant that it was meant only for the rich people. And it was kind of suspicious. Now I just knew something terrible was going to happen to it. I looked at the red guards. They were still busy moving the chest. I slipped off the bed and tiptoed across the room. If I could, if I could hide it before they saw me, I, I stooped down and reached for the book. Okay, and... What we learn about the author's attitude toward the Cultural Revolution, even though she might have been understanding at first, and she kind of justifies why things might be for old, here's something that's really kind of getting to her, the heart of her. She doesn't want to lose this because it means something to her. This stamp album probably symbolizes her getting older because it's when she went to school, and it also probably symbolizes her grandmother. But here she goes. She's taking this risk to grab this book. Hey, what are you doing? A voice demanded. I spun around in alarm. It was the Red Guard leader. I, I didn't do anything, I said guiltily, my eyes straying toward the stamp album. A stamp album? She picked it up. Is this yours? I nodded fearfully. You've got a lot of four-olds for a kid. She sneered as she flipped through it. Foreign stamps, too, she remarked. You little xenophile. Xeno means foreign or alien, and file means lover, so she's a lover of things from foreign lands. I, I am not, I blushed as I fumbled for words. The girl looked at Ji Yong and Ji Yun, who were still sitting on their beds watching, and she turned to another red guard. Get the kids into the bathroom so they don't get in the way of the revolution. She threw the stamp album casually into the bags of, bag of things to be confiscated and went back downstairs. She didn't even look at me. We talked about what the, the uh, symbolism of the stamp album means. To the Red Guard, it symbolizes 
outsiders and it symbolizes quarrels, but to Zhili Zhang, it actually is symbolizing her grandmother and, you know, becoming older and all the hard work that she put into it. Inside the bathroom, we could still hear the banging of furniture and the shouting of the Red Guards. Ji Yun lay with her head in my lap, quietly sobbing, and Ji Yang sat in silence. After a long time, the noises died down. Dad opened the bathroom door and we fearfully came out. The apartment was a mess. The middle of the floor was strewn with the contents of the overturned chest and drawers. Half of the clothes had been taken away. The rest were scattered on the floor along with some old copper coins. The chests themselves had been thrown on top of each other where the Red Guards decided to check the walls for holes where weapons could be hidden. Grandma's German clock lay upside down on the floor with the little door on its back torn off. I looked for my things. The wing of the butterfly had been completely knocked off the body. The bottle holding the glass beads had smashed and the beads were rolling all over the floor. The trampled candy wrappers looked like trash and the stamp album was gone forever. Now, that's the end of the story, but there is a uh, quick interview, if you care to read it, um, on the back here about Zhi Li Zhang. Um, and like I said, if you're interested in this story, I would definitely recommend reading The Red Scarf Girl. Now, what you need to do is you're going to be going back to Canvas, and there are two questions in the Read and Respond tab. So good luck, and I hope you enjoyed this story.